Hi, Sue. Hi, how are you? Well, I'm pretty good. We have a nice, nice day here today. Oh, it's beautiful here yesterday. It's supposed to be about 20 degrees cooler. It was in the late, low 70s yesterday. Wow, nice. Mm-hmm. Hey, you're looking really good. Thank you. I guess the yard work didn't kill me after all. Oh, it made, made you look, look uh, younger. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I should get outside more often. Uh-huh. It's good for you. Yeah, I should, too. Martha, my, Martha uh, my always goes My stepdaughter up. offered to help me a Thursday. She brought our, our grandson, actually great-grandson, over. He's seven. And, uh, of course, he wasn't a whole lot of help, but he thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> so with her here I felt like I really had to keep up with the young people yes well you did it so I slept well and then yesterday I tried again for a couple of hours and then I thought no th this is enough mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ta taxes were waiting for me oh yeah I yes I opened it I'm ready to pull down some information from the bank and stuff like that but I finally got my information yesterday, so I today oh. I was trying to figure out the, the uh, drug charges, and whew, gee whiz, I'm not even sure what they're all about. Oh, that must be a nightmare, all that. Mm -hmm. And some look like they've sent doubles. I, I, I don't know why. It's the same outfit, but... Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we get started this morning... Um... Our sequence hymn, our second hymn this morning is in Wonder, Love, and Praise. Our, our second hymn this morning is in Wonder, Love, and Praise, the small green hymnal. Just wanted to make sure that everyone has a copy of that near them. Um, I don't think that the insert says the exact number. It's 727, that one, which is right at the beginning. Seven two seven.
Good morning, everyone. Our opening hymn this morning is number 152, Kind Maker of the World, O Hear. And we will be singing verses 1 through 4. Our service begins with the penitential order in the front of the purple worship booklet. Blessed be the God of our salvation. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The Lord 
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Now this is a reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, who was the priest at Midian. Moses led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, and yet it was not consumed. And so Moses said, I've got to turn aside and look at this great sight and see why it is that the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And then he said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cries on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of this land, to bring them up to a land that is good and broad, a land flowing with milk and honey, the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites and the Jebusites. So the cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I've seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said to him, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and I say to them, If the God of your ancestors has sent you to me, and they ask me, well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God then said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of Jacob has sent, the God of Abraham and Isaac has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my title for all generations. And this is the word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. 
You will find this in your bulletin. We're reading it together responsibly. I will say the first verse up to the asterisk, and then you follow with the next. O oh God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. So will I bless you as long as I live. And lift up my hands in your name. My soul is content. As with marrow and fatness. And my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed. And meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my helper. Under the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. Our second reading is a letter a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. And they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us. So that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents and do not complain as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer these things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our sequence hymn this morning is in Wonder, Love, and Praise, number 727, As Panting Deer Desire the Water Brooks.
scoffers taunt me, where is your God now? My soul dissolves as I recall the throng, whose pilgrim hymns I led to Zion's faith brow. Why are you happy-hearted, O oh my soul? And why are you so mired in deep discord? Still put your hope and trust in God alone, whom I will praise, my Savior and my Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. At that very time, there were some presents who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. into your hands alone I come and ask believe into your hands alone I come and ask Why? Why did this happen? Why did it happen to me? Why did it happen to her? Why? It is a question I have heard often in the past several months. 
as I made my daily rounds at one of our local hospitals here in Boston. There, in my role as a chaplain intern, this question would predictably find its way into many rooms onto the lips of many patients and their family members. There is a painful urgency in the need to know why we suffer. Is it because of a flaw or a fault at the root of the situation or of every situation? Is it because the people who suffered deserved it? Is it because I deserved it? Does it have to do with the complex systems in which we are all embedded? The sinful actions or inactions of powerful people, the structural violence to which whole societies become desensitized with human lives as casualties? Is it simply that humans are imperfect, fragile, and mortal? Or because the created order is simply larger and more mysterious than human lives and deaths alone? or simply because tragic accidents have no explanation. These diverse hypotheses would sometimes vie for attention. Some felt plausible and others felt unhelpful. But my role there was not to seek explanations. Rather, it was to bring my wholehearted listening presence to this suffering and to seek alongside my patients an open space, a space where God could breathe a breath of life and peace, where we, fail, frail, where we frail creatures can find none in our own strength. In today's passage from Luke, we really hear two passages with a thematic hinge. In the first, we hear a dialogue between a common human understanding of suffering and sin and the understanding of these things revealed in Jesus. And in the second, we hear another dialogue between a common human understanding of God and the God revealed in Jesus. Both passages begin from where we so often find ourselves trapped in a dead end and they gently introduce a corrective that expands our vision and liberates us to more clearly behold the God of love and of possibility. In the first section of the passage, Jesus intuits a question on the part of his listeners. Why? Why did it happen to them? Those Galileans who died so brutally at the hands of Pilate, and those who died so suddenly under the rubble of that fallen tower. Surely they deserved it. Surely there was a flaw or a fault at the root of the situation. Surely it was their sin. Jesus, this man who magnetized crowds with his full and generous and trustworthy presence, lays their distracted theory to rest. No. No, those who suffer these things are no better than you, and no worse. But unless you repent, he says, you will all perish as they did. These words cut through the question, why did this happen? These words level the ground between those who suffer and those who observe from a safe distance. Facing squarely the reality of suffering and death, but on very different footing, Jesus' words also make space for a corresponding question. How will I live or act in response today and now? In the language of the church, how will you repent? How will you turn, change, Adopt a larger view that reconnects you with God's flow of larger life. This, too, was a question I heard asked, spoken in many ways by hospital patients who were finding the courage to face the present moment and its suffering as it was, not as they wished it were. These were people for whom suffering 
or the suffering of their loved ones seemed to stir depths of truth and meaning in response to life's purpose. Responses like, I don't have forever. Our time here is limited. I will make the most of the days I have. I want to let go of my resentment. I will stop blaming myself or anybody else. I want to forgive and be forgiven. Now I know that love is all that really matters. And one of my favorites, I can't feel it, but I trust it. God is doing something good. These moments of luminous clarity were so sacred to witness and honor. Just as Moses took off his sandals before the luminous clarity of that bush there in the wilderness, the bush that blazed with fire but was not consumed. It's with eyes attuned to this hidden potential that I began to gaze upon all the patients I visited. And here there was a clear invitation to practice seeing differently seeing more like the gardener in the second half of our passage, who sees the hidden potential in every situation that seems outwardly barren. I read this parable of the barren fig tree as a dialogue between a common human understanding of God and the God revealed to us in Jesus. Like all parables, it does its work in us through the interplay of many possible meanings all at once. It's a plausible dialogue between a landowner and a gardener. It has long been interpreted as a dialogue between God the Father and God the Son. It can be seen more broadly as a dialogue between God's long-suffering justice and God's persevering compassion. We can read it as a dialogue between parts of ourselves, including our own perceived fruitlessness, or a dialogue about our basic posture toward seemingly impossible situations or relationships. Part of its power is that the parable is left unresolved, open-ended. We are not privy to whether or not the tree bears fruit or is cut down. This parable opens onto a horizon line that turns our gaze back to that question. How will I live or act today and now in response? Like the question, why did this happen? The response, cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? Is a sensible outcome oriented posture. It's an orientation toward the past that wants to interrogate why potential has gone unrealized, why, and its bearing on our present experience of lack. If this is a familiar response to you, perhaps you can imagine how this posture might bleed into our experience of God and our interpretation of the parable. A God who comes often in the guise of a taskmaster, one who is primarily concerned with what we haven't done, how we have failed to measure up, or seen in a slightly different way, a God who grieves the lack of fruit growing where it ought to grow. It's in the middle of a garden, for goodness sake. What Jesus does here is so subtle and illustrates how gently, but how powerfully he seeks to introduce the open space the open door, the broader horizon into every situation we see as barren or impossible or fruitless. He comes to us, us landowners with our landowning gods, as the gardener. A gardening god comes to convince us with another perspective. Let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. If not, then you can cut it down. In other words, 
maybe this tree has more potential hidden beneath its outwardly barren reality. Maybe that potential is simply waiting for the right moment to come to fruition under conditions that are conducive to growth. This is an orientation toward the horizon of future possibility rather than past failure. It's a perspective introduced by a god less concerned with why than with what if. But what do we make of that last concession? But if not, you can cut it down. This would seem to leave room for the foreclosure of possibility for a moment that may yet come when the possibility of change, life, and growth are no longer open. Then the cutting down, if it comes, would seem to be a punishment for the failure to fruit. This is one received interpretation of much scriptural imagery of trees and axes, and it's never good news for the tree. This line of thought has its own integrity, since, as the psalmist writes, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Holy fear of dire consequences can motivate us to turn or change, the turning or changing of repentance. But that entry into a larger view, the other dimension of repentance that restores the flow of larger life, requires something more than fear. Fear is the beginning of wisdom, which implies that it can only take us so far. For the long haul, it takes love. And yet, love honors our agency, our consent, our capacity to choose. In other words, our freedom. The gardening God of the parable is love acting in service of that freedom, a love that goes to any length possible to convince us that change, life, and growth are possible. In other words, that love will win. I believe the gardener of life knows how the story will end. If it bears fruit, well and good. But honors the reality that based on the information at our disposal, we often can't imagine such a triumph. Rowan Williams writes that the resurrection of Christ is the open door at the heart of every situation. In Lent, we practice the way of repentance as preparation for Jesus' final journey, a journey through the heart of our suffering in order to show us, personally and in the flesh, that open door. The luminous clarity of true repentance bestows the larger view to which we are called by a God with whom all things are possible. Standing as you're able, I invite us to affirm our faith in the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Father the Almighty, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord. begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We will believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Prayers of the people. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our bishop and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good, good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have asked for our prayers, especially all in your bulletin this week. I'm sorry I did not bring it up with me. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and for, for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Defend us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To thee, O Lord, our God. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our offertory hymn this morning is number 148. 
and we will be singing verses 1, 3, and 5. Our service of Holy Communion continues in your purple wor worship leaflet. The Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God source of life and fountain of mercy. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels, and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. 
we would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory, giving himself freely to death on the cross he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done. Be done. Give us today our daily bread. <coughs> Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast.
gifts of God for the people of God. This is God's table, and all are welcome. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, we believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament of your body and blood. We love you above all things and desire to receive you into our souls. When we cannot receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into our hearts. As we hold out our hands in longing for communion with you, help us to embrace you, knowing that you are already here, and unite us wholly to you. Never permit us to be separated from you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Our recessional hymn this morning is number 392, Come Ye That Love the Lord.
be seated for announcements. Are there announcements from the congregation? Um, on Wednesday at 12.15, there will be Stations of the Cross here, followed by Bring Your Own Bag Lunch. There's a sign-up over on the lectern over here by the door with um, speaking parts for the Palm Sunday Passion Narrative. If you're interested in reading one of those parts, feel welcome to sign up or to talk to me. Um, it's time to sign up if you'd like to sponsor palms or flower, palms for Palm Sunday or flowers for Easter. Those um, forms are, I think, in the pews and probably in the desk by the, by the entry door. Is there anything I've forgotten? I want to give my appreciation to the Society of St. John the Evangelist and the Tri-Tank Initiative, which is an initiative of the Episcopal Church and I believe Virginia Theological Seminary that brought um, Brother Keith Nelson to us virtually this morning. I think we'll hear one more, one more virtual preaching monk during this season of Lent. Um, I guess it was also offered during the season of Advent so we can look forward to more resources like this from the church that are specifically targeted at small churches, kind of to provide some relief to part-time clergy and to churches who don't have regular serving clergy. There's also a bishops' committee meeting after church. I think all the bishops' committee are aware of that. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, Sue. Hi. I insured your cat today. Oh, good. 
Yeah, he was friendlier than usual. He's always very friendly, though. I think he enjoyed being held. Yes. <laughs> How's your cat? She didn't come up today. Usually she sh at least comes up for a few moments, but she didn't even do that today. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. She's probably looking out one of the uh, doors and looking at the birds. Yeah, thinking of going out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Though she doesn't go out. She'll go out on the deck, but uh, does not go off deck. Oh. Yep. So she's uh, she's pretty smart. Well, well, I suppose, yeah. She's sneaky smart. Oh. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> she just. Well, 